Connor Harrington, three-time Juxpose cover artist in Los Angeles for the Radio Juxpose podcast. Welcome back to Radio Juxpose. My name's Doug Gillen. On today's episode, Evan Preco sits down with old friend, contemporary Irish painter, and three times Juxtapose cover artist, Connor Harrington. Connor's journey into the art world, like many on this podcast before him, began with graffiti. Taking his craft as far as his hometown of Cork would allow, he relocated to London in the early 2000s, in a move that would very quickly cement him firmly as one of the leading figures in Europe bringing fine art sensibilities to the streets. Exploring themes of nationalism and masculinity, layers of his large-scale oil Baroque style paintings would be dissolved or abstracted, building what would become a signature marking not just to him but from wider street art culture as a whole. Harrington's work has been exhibited both on the streets and in galleries and museums around the world, but today Connor joins Evan just before the opening of his current show, When the Ship Goes Down, at Control Gallery in LA. Having only recently joined forces at the current Beyond the Street exhibition in London, where Connor debuted a gloves off insight into a possible new direction of his work. Throughout this conversation, the pair dive into two decades of work on the streets and in the studio, and it's great to finally have him as a guest on the podcast. Please enjoy Evan Preco in conversation with Connor Harrington right here, right now, on Radio Juxtapose. Connor, you are here for what is a a special solo show. I when hope the, so. When the ships, when the ship ship goes down, when the ship goes down. Yeah, we have to be careful how we say ship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When the ship goes down at Control Gallery, first off, it's a couple of days for, for the opening, so congratulations early. Thank you very much. It's a sunny now, so it's beautiful in LA. How are you feeling being here? Do you feel like you haven't had a solo show in the States in a bit? Like how, yeah. like just, just go through like a little bit. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like it's like uh, the Daily Show. How are you feeling right now? Uh, right now I feel, I feel a little bit excited and I feel a little bit terrified because I haven't had a show in a while and I haven't had a show in the States in a while. So I'm away from home. Um, but I have a lot of good friends here in LA, which is nice. So, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited by that terrified <laughs> yeah. what is like what do you mean you're terrified like is it just the is it is that how you always feel before an opening like just slightly yeah terrified? i mean I, I say that word a lot you know um terrified before an opening terrified before painting a mural especially that's kind of when i'm at my most uh neurotic and, and anxious <laughs> like you don't remember how to do it kind of yeah yeah like because you know murals are big and i don't paint them often enough so i'm kind of always like relearning how to how to do them and um, they don't flow so easily whereas i feel like in the studio because i paint every day well i paint five days a week i feel like it really flows i, I can see where the difference would be because you're painting multiple paintings at a time yeah so like the terror being terrified <laughs> you, can, you're, you have the comfort of different paintings around you yeah and also if you know you can you can you can fail at a painting and when i when a painting fails it never leaves the studio no one sees it nobody sees it and that happens a lot you know i think well not a lot but you know it happens enough time to kind of um to kind of keep me humble i guess where i'm like oh my god but with a with a mural if you fail if you fail on a mural or if you like if you fail in public it's um it's not great i want to go back to the la show but like what how far can you go before a painting is completely like how, when when you get to the point where you're like I can't fix this shit anymore. Oh, I just yeah, I just I, I think when I was younger, I used to just I wouldn't give up. I would just keep going, and I think I like I feel like I saved the painting, but I think really in hindsight I killed the paintings. Whereas now, what I just I just abandon them if it's not working. Like there's a few paintings for this show that's opening this week. Yeah, I just had to abandon them. I was like these aren't. No, these aren't working anymore. What are we gonna see in Control Gallery for for you? Like can you say you haven't had a show in a while. You can even see from the works that people have seen, the stuff we previewed on Juxpose, or even the stuff that's at the Beyond the Street show mm. at Saatchi in London, there's an alteration going on. Yeah, I think in, in the last few years, my works got a lot more political. And they've always been a little bit political. You know, it's always been there, but I think uh, political with a small p in the past, whereas in the last few years, I mean, I guess it's just the way that the world is going. We just kind of feel overwhelmed by kind of all the problems everywhere yeah. and then problems with finding a solution and yeah like... yeah and I, I think because i've always been interested in you know masculinity and ego and 
and things like that. And I'm just looking at like some of our leaders of the last few years, like in the, a lot of these paintings that I'm showing this week were born during the, like my, my current work was born during the Trump era and during the Boris era. Yeah. <clears throat> the kind of era of the big, kind of uh, just the big, you know, inverted commas, strong man, right. you know. Right. The perception of the strong man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think that's been that's been a huge change in my work. If you were to look back over the last ten or fifteen years, I feel like in a way my previous work was more hyper real, as in it was kind of like an exaggerated sense of realness. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of fighting and there was sword fightings and, and punch ups and you know dead animals. I was really kind of exaggerating things back then. Whereas now, I mean, there's there's still a an element of 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 of. Um, of kind of uh, caricature in my work still I think right. they're, they're and they're quite satirical um but the the real world is 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 much more present in my work correct me if I'm wrong it seems like the work that you're showing in LA it almost seems like the characters or the figures that you have in it look a little bit more perplexed mm. with their position yeah like they, the look the expression doesn't seem as like um they don't seem like they're imitating power then order do they feel like they're in, in the past, it seemed you know you had these characters that were like um, like the the people who would dress up in the, yeah. in the revolutionary era kind of Those garb and, and kind of like pr- present a position of power. These these characters look almost like transfixed with the confusion. I, I guess there was more of a facade of heroism in my previous work. Yeah, okay. I and mean, it was definitely a facade. It was kind of it was was for me anyway. I don't know what, what people took from it, but. Now I feel like I'm kind of breaking down that facade a little bit, and I'm, I'm quite interested in like the delusion that comes with you know, people that are in in power, like the Boris's and the Trumps, where like it's so obvious that things are falling apart, but they're they're still going. Right. And I think that's kind of that's basically the, what's happening in these paintings. Do, do you ever wish? <laughs> this is like I have to ask. Do you ever wish that it, it's like you you've dedicated your life to this kind of um, this this conversation mm. is it difficult almost for you to, con- to to know that you've got gone this far in your career and like you these are conversations that you still find yourself investigating like is it almost like a holy like, how have we gotten worse <laughs> yeah I, I mean i guess it gives me fuel doesn't it I yeah know. i mean there is a part of it yeah, yeah 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 if it wasn't for the kind of these huge cartoony characters that we have well i mean boris and trump aren't in power anymore but i feel like their shadow is, right. is kind of uh is their shadow is still long, but if it wasn't for this new um, new development in the last few years, I, I don't know what I'd be painting. Well, I guess maybe it's now it's more literal. Yeah, yeah. It's like and that's maybe why your work is more almost more literal. Yeah, it's definitely more literal. And I guess I don't know—is it because things seem quite bad or it's quite quite sh- quite sharp and in focus that I've, that it's it's made me go down that road with my work, or or is it also just the influence of social media that's like you know my brain is drowning in right. in stories and imagery so i'm kind of distilling all that into my work and i think for a long time as well like in the in the 2000s kind of when i first started painting and exhibiting in the in the street art scene like a lot, a lot of the early street art stuff was quite direct like a lot of the artists and i think that was that's why there was there was so much appeal to their work and why street art has reached massive audiences yeah. because uh, it doesn't take a lot of decoding to f- to figure out what a- what artists were saying, and in a way, I was kind of reacting a little bit against that in my work in the earlier days, where I was not deliberately trying to make it hard, but I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to be too obvious, maybe. Yeah. Um, and that's a hangover from art college as well, where they don't really they don't tell you to make difficult work, but you kind of get the impression that like, okay, difficult work people don't understand equals good you know <laughs> like it's kind of you know not that I was making really kind of uh, kind of impenetrable work but you know the ideas weren't as apparent right. I think for at least 10 years and um, so maybe it's just as I'm getting older I'm like oh, actually maybe I just need to kind of this has to make a bit more sense but you were also coming coming from graffiti mm. you were already working with a sense of anti-authority Anti-authority yeah. behavior, yeah. anti-authoritarianism. Yeah. So it was inherent that maybe you were going to do something that could have been perceived as what your work is. It's like there's mm. these questions of authority. Yeah. Is that is that apparent to you, or is that? Kind I, of- I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I I guess that's where it all you know. Like I wasn't a serious graffiti writer by any stretch of the imagination, but like if you know, from the age of fourteen to 
I don't know, 18, 19. It was probably about five years there where that's all I cared about. Um, was that serious? Yeah, well, yeah. it was. I haven't heard you say it that way before. I think, I think yeah, I think it's something that kind of people mightn't realise because I, I suppose I don't talk about it that much. I didn't do loads of graffiti because, like, Cork, where I'm from, didn't really have much of a graffiti. I mean, there was, like, there was a couple of us. Like, there was literally <laughs> me and a mate. You know, there was never, like, back back then anyway, there was never more than a handful doing anything, so... What was your... Did you have a crew name? Uh, yeah, yeah. You're not allowed, you're no, not I, no, I did, yeah. It was called ABC, which was Artists Beyond Control, which yes. I was really proud of that name. Yeah, that's <laughs> really good, the ABC crew. Yeah, yeah, but it was kind of like... Like, there was a hand... I mean, it was basically me, and then I had one other friend that wrote... That was in the crew for a couple of years, and then he stopped, and then maybe... I asked a couple of other young people if they want... Like, younger writers, if they wanted to get involved. It was never really a crew. Okay. Because uh, there wasn't really a strong scene, you didn't really feel the need to kind of get up and <laughs> all the time you could just like do it whenever you yeah, felt like it, yeah. you know? So it was very, very casual. But having said that, like all I did was, was, was like draw in my sketchbook and like devour subway art, devour spray can art. I would devour like the Source magazine once a month when they had that, like that the graffiti one. page. Yeah, because yeah. that, was, that was kind of like prior to the internet, that was... I got. I couldn't get graffiti magazines, so maybe when I was nineteen or twenty, I, I was able to send away to get graffitism or get twelve ounce profit or something. But yeah, there was right. a good five or six years there where my only kind of um, kind of a regular graffiti update was that one page yeah. in the Source magazine, and then Hip Hop Connection, which was the British version, British hip hop magazine that had a double page spread every month as well. So they were my only two sources. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So walk me through, because you will always be, and this is great, associated with that kind of the bridge between street art and fine art. Yeah. I always think of it as like really, really wonderful, the group of artists that went to the Family Festival in Southern oh, Italy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Being kind of like Angelo kind of capturing a particular group that was doing this stuff. Yeah. And you were part of that. Yeah. But... That goes kind of that kind of comes after even the Lazaris kind of early yeah. Lazaris like when when like you get to London what is happening in London in the early two thousands like what was the conditions by which it grew something that's special yeah like it like it, it, it really is special. yeah I think so and I don't think it, like like everything you don't realize it at the time so it's only now kind of seventeen or eighteen years later that you're like oh god that was amazing <laughs> <laughs> but I, I moved in two thousand and four um, and. I got a job washing dishes and I was painting, painting in the evenings. I was really determined, you know, like, like I was quite naive as well and idealistic. I was like, yeah, how hard can it be? <laughs> I think if I knew how hard it, it actually is, I probably never would have tried. But I just thought, especially coming from a place like Cork, which is, you know, quite a, quite a small city with a very small art scene and you know I, I don't know how many people were making a living as artists back back then and I'm sure whatever they were doing it was not what you were trying to do yeah yeah I definitely felt that as well I definitely thought well I kind of can't really stay here was it more like landscape kind of stuff in Cork or was it was it was there like a good active kind of contemporary scene yeah there was well? a co an active contemporary scene but it would have been quite small I think yeah. yeah definitely quite small and I never really related to it either because of my interest in graffiti and stuff, I just really felt, especially back then. I mean, it's a bit different now because there's such crossovers happening in in contemporary art. Um, but back then, it really felt like it was. I was like, oh no, 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 I'm a I'm a graffiti guy. But then at the same time, I really loved contemporary painting, and I was like, oh, I'm a graffiti guy, but I want to be a painter. And I was like, ah. who who was like that contemporary painter that you were like <sighs> back then? I mean, they weren't contemporaries, but like Chuck, you know, Chuck Close would yeah, have been a okay. huge. See, he's from the from the sixties, but he would have been a huge influence on me and and kind of Gerhard Richter. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of like the... Eric Fischel. A lot of, yeah. I, I suppose, a lot of kind of seventies, eighties artists, yeah. maybe that I I loved their work. They had nothing to do with graffiti, and I was like, how do I do that? But kind of with graffiti. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I can see the Fischel and. Um... And Richter yeah, influence yeah. today, even in your yeah, what you do. Yeah. I mean, I, and Jenny Savile as well. Actually, yeah. I mean, I think she is yeah, she she well, is yeah. probably my all time favorite artist. I think she's the best painter working today, and I would have discovered her when I was in art college. Um, I think she's about ten years older than me, so a lot of her kind of famous breakthrough paintings were. I think it was her degree show that broke through. 
those like really exaggerated forms, yeah, those yeah, giants. Yeah. You know, sometimes I refer to my paintings as, as giants as well. Um, and like and and Chuck Close painted, you know, really large heads. So it's just that idea of you know, kind of larger than life forms. Yeah. Which is great. This is something I want to investigate further on yeah. in the conversation. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, this kind of idea of larger than life. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So when anyway, yeah, I kind of gone off gone off track there. So when I got to London, by the way, everybody, we we've eaten a very very large midday Mexican <laughs> meal um, at El Coyote in West Los Angeles. You know it. The platters are quite big. So we are working our way through a post-lunch yeah, conversation. Tacos. You have these influences that are not really going to be... They're, they're, they they're are, a different world in the way. You're trying to push something slightly. You're trying to... You're, yeah. you, you personally are trying to push to something different. I think kind of one of the... What was one of the hard things was that I didn't really have an example of anybody else that was trying to bridge the two worlds as well. When I was in art college, I went to art college in Limerick and my tutors were quite hard on me and they were really, you know... I'd imagine every... Most tutors in most art colleges in the late 90s, early 2000s would just would have been very dismissive of graffiti. What was the most dismissive thing that was said to you? Uh, mm, uh, I don't, I don't want to say. <laughs> is there anything that in the critique of what you were doing then that you kind of like still do today and you're like, seek, it's still... <laughs> there was a couple of things said, but uh, yeah, I mean, they just didn't take it seriously at all, yeah, you know, right. so whatever. Um, I mean, I suppose to be, to be fair to them, <laughs> there wasn't many people, like graffiti in the late 90s was graffiti. Like street art hadn't, you know, street art was in its infancy. Yeah. There wasn't really the culture of doing you know, exhibitions and stuff. But they, w one of my tutors that kind of showed a bit more of an interest, he, had, he, he was the person that introduced me to Street Market by Stephen Powers and uh, Barry McGee and Todd James. Right. So I kind of feel like, I think, was that, let me see, was that 2000, 99? Uh, 99, 2000, yeah. Yeah, and I think, not that that saved me, but I think that gave them a little bit of, oh, okay, so here's an example of people from the same kind of, visual background as, as Connor and they're doing something so I mean it's a really good thing for an instructor to show you yeah yeah I mean, that's like they're very I mean obviously that street market kind of was a quite a pivotal moment for lots of the, the art oh world. huge yeah so, yeah and when you think that that's all that's over 20 years ago now it's like it's oh, kind of incredible yeah. really how how um how ahead of its time it was but kind of the flip side to that was that that tutor then was trying to push me down an installation kind of right, avenue yeah, yeah. whereas I'm very much a 2D guy I just want to paint them like yeah. I, it, since you mentioned it I have to assume you get a kick out of being in shows that Todd and yeah and Steve are in yeah, I mean yeah, and just yeah, like yeah. recently like just being in oh, Barry as well like, yeah. and then Futura so that, that was I think so there was kind of two kind of big kind of light bulb moments for me. Number one was being was when my tutor showed me street market. Although it's so different to what I do, I was kind of like, oh my god, that's amazing, and that's really inspiring, and it's so positive that kind of that kind of graffiti guys are doing this because they they brought it to vet to Venice, didn't they? I think, and that's how, yeah. why my tutors knew about it. But at the same time, I was like, ah, but it's so different to what I do. I couldn't quite put two and two together to how it would kind of work for me. After the summer, after my third year in in art college, I, I, I went to Utrecht in Holland to spend a summer there. Beautiful college town, but such a lovely town. It's nice, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, work, I worked in a, in a polyfiller factory, putting tubs of polyfiller into, into a box <laughs> for a whole summer. And one of the reasons why we went there is because, well, we, we, we knew we, we had a hookup at the, <laughs> at the polyfiller factory, so we knew we could get a job there, you know. You rode it and you rode a bike around and it. I, so. Yeah, but no, I didn't ride a bike, actually. Oh, but really? we had yeah, trams everywhere, so around yeah, the trams. Yeah, but okay. because Holland is such a a great like like a graffiti scene as well and they've got hall of fames everywhere we didn't have hall of fames in cork at the time and i knew i could just get trains here and there and i could do graffiti so that's you know i could go paint that's why i did it but um yeah i that's where i came across the futura book he had a yellow and black book and that was literally like i think that was probably one of the most um inspiring moments in my in my in my youth i'm glad you said all that because you you land in London. Yeah. You're washing dishes. Yeah. You're painting at night. Yeah. Something's happening in London. Is there something happening in London? Or is there like, you're kind of like... Yeah, I think there was something happening in London, although I wasn't really that aware of it. But I saw, um, I saw, I was a big fan of magazines because like that, you know, obviously right. that's how I got to know Juxtapose. And that's right. how, you know, prior to social media, that's how you kind of knew about what was happening yeah. in art. And on the cover of Art Review, 
in 2005 was Deface. And that was a huge moment. I remember being like, oh my God, Deface on the front cover of Art Review. Because he was opening a gallery called the Outside Institute that then went on to become Stolen Space right, Gallery. Right, yeah, right, it was a precursor. Right, yeah, the, the name yeah it was a great right. name. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. so excited. I was like, oh my God. And I emailed him. Like, I, I, didn't, you know, I didn't know him at all. I just emailed him. I was like, hey, I'm, a, I'm an Irish artist here. And I sent him a few. Because I had done an exhibition in Cork before, before moving. So that was one of the things I wanted to do before I left for London was do an exhibition. What did that work look like? What did that work look like? It's like what, you would, what would you have shown Deface? Like what would that have been? Yeah, so that would have been portraits of a friend of mine. Okay. So it painted in black and white and then a net panel beside it that had loads of graffiti tags. Mm -hmm. So that was when I started tagging on canvas, which I started in art college and then kind of continued it afterwards. So there are kind of two images juxtaposed together. So a, a very kind of realist black and white portrait on one side and then I would mask off the canvas. And then on the next section, I would do lo loads of loads of tags, layered tags, and start scraping the tags to kind of you know emulate the buff and stuff like that. Right. And I put that line down the middle just to kind of because I felt very much at the time that graffiti and fine art or contemporary art were two different worlds. Partly because I'd gotten a bit of a hard time in art college, and that was me kind of uh, you know going through it a little bit. So I put that line down the middle and be like, here are the two things that I love. I love painting and I love graffiti, but they kind of can't coexist right <laughs> so that's, that's, was, that's actually quite at the time quite quite clever yeah i, I don't know I, well the, yeah thanks but <laughs> they, yeah, they um yeah so I, that's i yeah i did my first show with well, did my first exhibition with, with that and then it was then when i moved to london around the time that i got to know d face and some of those guys i started to blend the two okay. so the tag started coming through the figure that's i mean i guess i i mean this is all quite subconscious as well it wasn't really a oh, everything's beginning to work out. I can now bring graffiti and, and, and kind of contemporary art portraiture together. But that's just, that's just what happened. So do you get a show? Mm. You, got a, you had shows with Stolen Space, didn't you? Yeah. Have a, you had a show so I, I, really early on. Yeah, so I, I was in the, f I was at the second show at the Outside Institute. The first show was Scene, I think. They did a solo show with Scene first. And then the second show was the Fiends show where D-Face just invited a bunch of artists who were in London who were kind of doing interesting things. A few artists that had come from graffiti, a few that had come from street art, a few that were illustrators and were painting outdoors. Like there was Adam Neat, Insa, oh, yeah, Insa yeah. come from graffiti, uh, Steph Pleats, Will Barris, a lot of those guys. Oh, yeah. um, maybe She One was in it, Shock One I yeah. think was in it, I think. Kind of scroll collective yeah exactly yeah, 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 yeah that yeah. whole thing was going on yeah, as yeah. well it was kind of like it was you know there's a lot of people who had i guess th there was just a lot of people like me who had done graffiti in the 80s or 90s but kind of got a little bit frustrated by how kind of um how kind of strict it was you know and just mm -hmm. wanted to do something a bit more expressive or a bit more a bit more arty or whatever yeah. you know yeah, right. yeah i think that's how street art was born really so yeah so that's how i got involved with the London scene. And then like somehow, some way, this this thing called Lazaridis Gallery yeah. Yeah. happens. Yeah. And it's not just London artists. Yeah. It's artists from San Francisco, LA, yeah. New York, and vice versa. Like they're they starting to go back and forth between yeah. the countries. And it was a very to be part of it mm. was exciting. It was a fucking roller coaster. Yeah. I remember being with Juxpa at the time, it was just like it was a roller coaster of coverage. It was just like it was a lot of energy. Yeah. And it was a kind of an, a cultural exchange, but it was happening in London. Like London yeah, was like yeah. kind of the epicenter of it. Yeah. And you were in part of it. Yeah, yeah. I got involved fairly early on, I think. Um I think I was recommended by I mean, I guess when you think back to two thousand and six, two thousand and seven like compared today to compared to today, I don't think there was there wasn't loads of artists that were doing what we were doing. Yeah. You know, it was quite a small... We were in the car trying to talk about some of the names and we kind of went yeah. through the <laughs> roster of names. Yeah, like it really felt quite small. And I think, and again, it was prior to... Like, when was Instagram? Was that 2010-ish? 10, yeah. I don't think people really started using it until 10, 11, maybe? Yeah, yeah. So things were very... That was definitely an accelerant, I guess, when, yeah. when Instagram took off. But prior to that, I feel like things were a lot slower. And the Lazaridis Gallery was definitely a it was definitely a big moment, I think, for for London and for I guess the global scene as well. Yeah, yeah, very exciting time. The first time you were on the cover of Juxpose was two thousand eight. Yes, and the work you were showing had 
it was kind of a mix. It had a kind of a graphic quality yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a graphic quality. So they, so that was when, so that was the I, I for the, I did a couple of shows where I painted. Um, that would have been the first time actually I started doing the kind of historical thing that I do. Yeah. So prior to that, I was kind of painting my mate and a few other friends. You know, I was a figurative painter, so trying to figure out what to paint and you're like I just painted my friends <laughs> I guess like a lot of people do but then um, just randomly came across this kind of tiny tiny subculture of kind of historical military reenactors reenactors yeah. that's yeah that's the word yeah. reenactors yeah really kind of random so they're not it's just, you're not really painting history you're painting people who are desperate to, to be part of history almost yeah yeah I mean I guess you could look at it in various different ways they would probably say that they're really you know obviously they're really passionate about history and kind of making it come to life and it's a it's an educational um uh, thing as well where people go and watch them I've been to I've been to a few events back then but what I kind of liked about it just kind of putting my own little twist on it was how it was kind of like they were they were the every everyday people who would dress up as generals at the weekend and it kind of reminded me a little bit of, a, of, of, of hip-hop and graffiti as well and just that idea of especially hip-hop where 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 rappers will will will, will assume this kind of you know superhero role you know it's like the ultimate braggadocio. Yeah, it really is putting on it, having a, a different name and a not, you know, like this yeah. kind of moniker. Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The costume and it, like it's the ultimate power dressing, really. Yeah. And from, I, I, I liked, I just liked the visuals of it. I liked the aesthetic of it. But what were they reenacting? Help me out with like, the first reenactment thing you went to. What were they reenacting? So the first one I went to was like a kind of a medieval one where they were all wearing like heavy kind of suits of armor and stuff, right, which is kind of funny because I was watching... I watched House of Dragon on the on the plane yesterday. I hadn't seen it at all, so I was able to binge about seven or eight episodes on the flight from London, and and a lot of it really reminds me of those earlier paintings and going to that re those reenaction events where because there's a jousting scene in House of Dragons as well. I remember they they they, they reenact the jousting as well, but I think just just aesthetically, I I wasn't so into into the armor <laughs> as much yeah. as later when I kind of went to. Because I'm not really like a history guy, you know. I don't have gr a great sense of history, which I always find kind of find a bit strange, considering sort of what I paint. And people probably, I think some people might presume that I've got a great grasp on history, but I really don't. But isn't that the point? Yeah, well, it is for me. Yeah, like a it lot kind of, my of is the point that you're. It's like if you were to be a super super history buff, yeah. it kind of it's almost better that you're watching these reenactors you're not necessarily like you don't know every single no 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 I don't battle no. or you know every, it allows for you to have freedom when you're painting them yeah. to sort of interpret contemporary well, elements well, to it exactly because like the, my, the, my paintings have never been about the past i mean there's things about the past that are important in my work but i'm not painting history at all I, i'm painting today and i always have been and even back then you know 15 years ago with those reenactions I wasn't painting like a Napoleonic reenactor. It wasn't about the, the Peninsula Wars or whatever. It was about some guy who likes to dress up. And to me, that's kind of like this kind of assuming this kind of hyper masculine role as well. And kind of what interested me as well, because you can go around and, 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 and chat to them. And it's like, I, I kind of, that was the first time I picked up on this kind of sense of nationalism in some of them you know right. i mean i don't want right. to I, I don't want to kind of shit on the no, reenaction you know but you found that there were some people that were for, really for some of them i think yeah. yeah especially for the for the napoleonic ones because that would be the french versus the english right that's right. the battle of waterloo and all that right. and i think and they every year in july i think it's july they go to waterloo to to reenact it and i think the the reenaction people from all over europe go there so it's like a huge event for them and um right, right. And one English guy that I was chatting to, he was telling me about, like, you know, he was salivating, like, thinking about what he was going to go. And he's like, I can't wait to kill me some Frenchies. And I, just the way he said it, I was like, oh. Yeah. Was he supposed to be in character when he was talking no, to you? No, no, no. Post, yeah, post production? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could just go and chat to them and kind of ask him about, you know, whatever. So, because it was just a whole new world to me, right. really. So I just went up to say hello. Yeah, and that kind of, that nationalistic element to it, I think that was kind of the... The, the germination really because that's really kind of come to the fore over the years in my work right uh, so how does that you're you're a painter and then you're all of a sudden you're you're painting murals mm. so you're in the street art scene and you're interested in this certain topic yeah and you're trying to let's be honest when you do a mural you're kind of trying to do a big it's a big painting yeah you're, you're not necessarily doing the traditional mural uh 
identity. No, I mean, I think that's probably why I find my murals a bit tricky as well, uh, to go back to being terrified all the time. <laughs> because I'm an oil painter and I love oils, like it's, you know, it's it's just so flexible. There's so much you can do with them. They stay dry for a couple of days. You can really manipulate the paint. Right. Whereas with a mural, you're just using latex paint and it just dries. Like if it's a hot, like like if it if it's hot, it dries instantly. Right. You know, and it's really frustrating to work with at times. Yeah, but you're also dealing with the subject matter that could be slightly misinterpreted yeah. for purposes other than what you're trying. To yeah, 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 yeah. That's definitely. Yeah. Has that been a problem? Uh, not yet, but um, well, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. Um, so we did this mural in Miami in right. 2017, and that was kind of the first one of my murals. I think that was a bit more kind of obviously political, which was you know part of the juxtaposed clubhouse, but it was yeah. like you knew you wanted to make yeah. a statement. But it's it's amazing because anyone who's seen it, and you probably have, because it's the, the wonderful big, huge mural with the American flag kind of covering the man's face. Yeah. It could only be a critique, and yet somebody could see it as, as, as a almost... Yeah. In the way that Trump could take a song that's yeah. very like anti-Trump and make it part of his campaign. Like, yeah. it could have been... That's, I guess that's what I'm trying to... Like, uh, I know you could perceive it in different ways. Like, I was quite nervous going to paint that. I mean, I, okay, I'm nervous before every mural for kind of technical reasons, but with this one in particular, because it was 2017, Trump was in power, I felt like I was doing a like a proper political mural. And so it, it's, like, it's, a, it's like a guy standing and there's a, an American flag covering his face and I call it the blind patriot because, right. you know, I feel like... And, 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 and that mural was inspired by Colin Kaepernick's right. protest. Now, I don't know anything about American football. I don't think, like, prior to that, I don't think I could have named a single American footballer if you had asked me, but, but um, his protest um, kind, of, kind of reached us over over in London and I just I couldn't believe the I couldn't believe how people were so upset with him protesting yeah you know I really couldn't because I thought what he was doing was so important also by the fact that he asked military members what's the best way to protest yeah. and they're the one who made the suggestion and you would think yeah, that that would have been so res it's so respectful you know yeah. he's taking a knee is is one of the ultimate signs of respect but still people turned on him but, you know, America is a very uh, volatile place. I think it's a lot more like I think that's one of the things that Trump has shown for those of us who, who don't live here. And, you know, I visited here a lot, but I don't think I had any idea just how, how volatile America is. So that was really the inspiration for it. Kind of a blind patriot just kind yeah. of depicting a lot of people just they can't see past their flag essentially um so when i went to paint the mural i thought oh god what if i upset people because i don't want to upset people either it's this kind of a weird thing where you want to you want to say something but you don't want to upset people um and i know it's downtown miami so it's you know it's a very diverse it really was a very diverse yeah. area i mean even being spending the, the weeks that we spent there like it's not it actually felt like downtown miami felt very much like a representation of america it was, it was yeah. all sorts of different people kind of watching you paint and it was it was a really i thought it was a really fantastic time to paint yeah although like i think may, like maybe so i painted it basically I, I painted it and i was i was quite happy i think it's probably my favorite mural even just technically i yeah, painted it you know i was happy with how even the the context of it on that wall but I kind of expected people to have a problem with what I was doing. Um, I was expecting people, because, you know, Americans are much more forward than Europeans, I think. You know, if you, people will come right up to you. It's one, one of the things I've definitely noticed about painting around the world is that when you paint in America, people will be in your face. Whether they are positive or negative, they have no problem. Just right. I, Yeah, the first time I, I painted in L.A. in two... Painted here in 2010, I just did a, a very small piece on Abbott Kinney here, actually, I, and people like people were just coming right up, up and filming me, which even still, if somebody just put a, put a phone in my face, I'd be uncomfortable with it. But back then in 2010, I don't think I even had a camera on my phone back then. And people were filming me and trying to interview me, like just random people. I remember one guy saying, go, be like, oh, what's your inspiration? And I was like, what? I'm just to put in context, this is 15 years in the making, this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're not a man of few words, but... I think you've always let the work kind of. Yeah. You'll, yeah. You you will leave messages on your Instagram, and you'll kind of explain a little bit. But you're, you've yeah. always been quite good about. You kind of let, and this is kind of. I think this is all kind of leading to this. You've sort of let the work. You've kind of let people figure it out themselves yeah. a little bit, which yeah. I, I love. And there's like a really, 
you know, there's that really wonderful mural. I don't know if it's still there. The one on the Truman Brewery, yeah, brewery that's kind of kind of faded. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you sort of just let it. Even with your fine artwork, you've kind of yeah. let people figure it out themselves, and you let them beat people over the head with like, no. "This is my meaning." Yeah, I mean, I suppose again, it's partly because I don't want to have to spell it out to people, and I think you know, art is in the eye of the beholder. You know, it's a cliche, right. but it's right. it's true. But then at the same time, I think maybe. So, I, you know, I don't naturally feel comfortable doing interviews or speaking about my work. Even when people come to the studio, I'm kind of like, uh, you know, like I, I, it, it, it kind of flows from my mind to the canvas quite easily. But then trying to actually verbalize it, <laughs> I'm like, uh, what? I think maybe just the way that the world is changing as well. Things are getting a bit more polarized and... Yeah, I just thought maybe it's time to start explaining myself a bit. I think the reason why I felt like we were probably going to end up doing the podcast, like it is actually going to happen, mm-hmm. was the the work that you have up at the Saatchi and Beyond the Streets, the one with the the actual depiction of Fox News oh, on yeah, the TV yeah, screen. Yeah. And it was the first, I thought, very literal, mm. kind of you were like, if you didn't know before, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm making this contemporary. Yeah, I want you yeah, to yeah. see this now. I've got this guy wrapped in the bunting. The bunting, yeah, yeah. And here's this Fox News thing, and there's like all these conversations. And then even recently, the idea that Tucker Carlson has been caught saying how much he disliked Trump yeah, behind the scenes yeah, and what yeah, he's yeah, presenting yeah. on TV being so different. I felt that that painting is so good. Oh, thanks. I think it's one of your best paintings. Oh, and I think, not just because I, I just thought it was very bold of you to yeah. do and I, and I knew that there was like something you were it's almost like you you were maybe I'm speaking for you but maybe you're just like fed up you're like god a li- a little. Fuck, here we go I'm yeah. just, here you go I'm gonna show you now this one talking about I mean there was a few few reasons for that painting I guess that was like definitely a, like a lockdown painting I and guess. I had seen yeah. that in the studio yeah. that, like I think last year last probably. year yeah it's, it's, it's probably the only painting that I've ever done where I really didn't know if I liked it or not like normally I, I'm either happy with a painting or I'm not kind of have a good judge of my own work I think but with that one I was like and a couple of people that came in were a bit, I think one, one friend came in and he was a little bit perplexed by it. I think people were a bit surprised, but like, oh, oh. I don't remember what my reaction was. At I think it was positive. Yeah, yeah, you were one of the few positive people, actually. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to kind of, I, mean, I guess like any artist, we're just trying to distill what we're taking in. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure things out as well, you know. I'm, yeah. I don't think... Um, I know exactly what it is I'm trying to say all the time, but we're just trying to trying to work it out as we go along. Why why the bunting? Explain a little bit about the bunting. Yeah. I feel like in America we have bunting, but like in the UK, yeah. and maybe maybe in Ireland too, there's something about bunting that's quite important. Probably more of a British thing, I guess, and Irish to a degree, but it's something that we take out for parties. So it's very twee. It's very innocent. If you have like a little little village fair or if you've got a kids party yeah. you'll have the bunting out um, for elections and I think you kind of have a version yeah. of it here as well yeah, we do, you know? we do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. for like 4th of July like our, our Independence Day kind of I think we yeah. use bunting but it doesn't we don't necessarily I think the way you're using bunting is probably different than the way an American might think about possibly so we would use it to celebrate something so in the first few paintings where I used the bunting my the guy was rapping so he was wrapping those TVs in bunting kind of celebrating the the propaganda celebrating the Fox Fox News and I did a few paintings like that I also did a painting where there's a big rock on a plinth which you know I was kind of inspired when the when the statue started falling during all the Black Lives Matter protests and that kind of got me thinking about other you know the, the, just the idea of statues falling st- yeah. statues being toppled which has happened throughout history you know it's not just a recent thing right. people like to think it is but when you look into it like you know like the like in, like in Dublin in 1966, we had a, a, a called Nelson's Pillar. So a, a statue to Horatio Nelson was put up in Dublin after the, after he won the Battle of Trafalgar, and then in 1966 the IRA blew it up. You know, which is just I just think it's really really interesting. And uh, during the fall of Baghdad as well, all those statues were pulled right. down. The ones yeah, of Saddam yeah, Hussein yeah. Uh, when the when the Soviet Union was collapsing, and the first thing to to start falling are the, all the all the statues, and they had a lot of statues. 
And then in America in recent years, it, they haven't been toppled so much as they've been in discussion about removal. Yeah. So it's like a different kind of... Yeah, I mean, I think that's what happened down in Bristol. And that was kind of the right. impetus for, for a lot of my work um, with the with the Colson statue, because that I think people were unhappy with that for a long time. Mm-hmm. And a lot of community groups had tried to take it down because, you know, he was a slave trader. He made an absolute fortune out of the slave trade. And that statue was put up. So he's he's from the 1600s, but that statue was put up in the... Um, during the Victorian era, mm-hmm. as kind of like I think the, the the person who put it up wanted to wanted to inspire Bristol to kind of um, to kind of reemerge as this kind of force of of industry and commerce like it had been unfortunately during the slave trade era. Um, but for so for a long time, people want to take down that statue, but like bureaucracy just they wouldn't take it down, and sometimes they just have to be taken down by force. Right. And I just thought that, that you know, the, the, it's such a powerful act when the public just gets so pissed off with something and they just have to take matters into their own hands and take it down. That becomes a whole new discussion. Yeah, 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 it is. I mean, I get the thing about you can't just go tearing things down, but at the same time, because in, in Bristol in particular, I think they had tried for, for decades to take it down and nobody would listen. So, right. so sometimes, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. But so yeah, to go back to the, to go back to my paintings, I, I did this painting where I where I was really interested in the plinth and kind of thinking about who we put on plinths, you know, because really that's forced on us. You know, I don't think there's any consultation. Like, there's a consultation to take down a statue, but there's no consultation about who, putting it up in the first place, right. which is a little yeah. bit kind of weird and wrong. So I was thinking about plinths and I was thinking about the all the destruction that's caused by a lot of men who are on plinths. Right. So I put a huge rock on a plinth. And uh, and that rock was kind of to to kind of signify you know all the the rubble and destruction caused by these people. So and uh, and I was wrapping that in bunting just the way that it, that's all celebrated. So I did those paintings, and then I thought actually maybe it's more interesting and more kind of direct if I instead of having this guy wrapping various objects in in bunting, what if I just get him wrapping himself in bunting? Because he's again, it kind of it's quite. You know, it's quite cartoony. It's quite. This is also like goes back to like they kind of look a little perplexed. Like, are, am I celebrating? Am I? What is my history? What? Yeah. Why? Why do I care about these things? Like, why? Why do we? I, I think it kind of reflects a lot of conversations that are happening in in a lot of European countries. You know, like Euro, European countries that have a, a difficult history, which is most, you know, like Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, you know, I think maybe Ireland is one of the few countries that, that hadn't, that, that hadn't colonized anyone, you know, we were colonized for a long time, but there's a huge discussion going on in the UK about, about its history and, and how it's, how it's taught. Um, I've always been really kind of perplexed and disappointed when I talk to, to British friends about Ireland because they have no idea unless they kind of really studied history in univer- at a university level. But I think right. in school, it's not really, you know, it's not really thought about what happened in the famine or, or various things. So so that kind of these discussions, I think, I feel like there's a there's almost like a crisis going on, both in terms of kind of these former colonial powers where they're like, oh God, how do we fucking deal with our past? Because people are Googling, and, you right. know, yeah. people are figure thing, figuring things out and people, you know, aren't happy and there's, like with America, there's a lot of discussions about reparations and yeah. and things, and then also kind of on a, there's also like a, a bit of a crisis in, in what well, some people would call it a crisis in masculinity. You know what is what what is a man these days? So right. I think that's why my my man in these paintings is kind of going through all sorts of things. The show at Control Gallery that you are set to open, I like this idea that we, I wanted to go back to about this larger than life thing. Yeah, and that I I think. Again, seeing a lot of your work in person, mm. the the scale is so important because you, there is this imposing kind of masculinity about yeah, them, but yeah. they're but they're kind of as we said, they're kind of like these. This almost like it. They it's like uh, insecure security. They, yeah. they, they these characters feel about their masculinity and yeah. putting them so big, scale matters. Just strictly from a painting point of view, it's. Um... It's more fun to paint big. Um, I'm also used to painting murals, even though it's a different medium. But still, like, I, I like I like painting figures to a scale that are that's larger than life. It's probably also my kind of inspiration from Jenny Savile, whose figures are huge, and Chuck Close, as I mentioned as well earlier. Um, I like to think that with my with my paintings, that I'm somehow trying to kind of take them down a little bit. You're trying to take your characters down a little bit. Yeah, not in scale, but I'm like, you know, I yeah. like so I'll, I'll paint them and then I'll spray. I'd spray them with a solvent and, and start wiping wiping them away, wiping away details. Um, 
kind of like this idea of, of, of things falling apart and things yeah. crumbling and, you know, things really being on the edge. Are you friends with your characters? Hey! Are, they, are, yeah. these, are these characters, like, are they people that you... It's like, are you trying to help them? Are you trying to like let? The, are, what? No, I don't. I'm, yeah. I don't think I'm painting from a from a sympathetic point of view. Yeah. I don't I, think I, I am. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think as time goes on, it's getting less and less. That's exactly. Yeah. I was gonna say like you seem. <laughs> that's why they yeah. like they look so like. Oh shit! I think he's painting me. I don't think he's painting <laughs> me. I, yeah, I can see that you're yeah. not. No, no, I don't think so. Um, and I, I, I think the way I'm going as well, it's probably going to get a little bit more apparent, but. Yeah, so I think for a long time, for maybe 10 years, I was just trying to figure it out. And the, the paintings kind of reflected graffiti a little bit and kind of my experiences with, mm -hmm. with kind of... Like, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> does LA... Does any... Like, does... You know, you have this... Los Angeles is... Obviously, it's Hollywood. Even yeah. if, like, we were kind of talking about earlier off, off microphone about how... Yeah. You know, the film industry has been decentralized in mm. recent years, but Hollywood will always be Hollywood. Yeah. LA will always be LA. It's the, the light. It's the, the kind of people come here to renew themselves or to find a new self or to, yeah. or to yeah. kind of escape something. That just, yeah. There is a, a very much, we're at the end of the world. I can say this. I'm from California. I'm allowed to say it. It's like the end of the world, edge, the cliff. Like people yeah. are here to kind of like, let's, let's make myself new and better. And then here you are presenting these paintings that have these people that are kind of like in dress up, kind of going through like their own Hollywood moment in their own head, and then kind of perplexed and history is sort of on, is over them. Feel like how do you feel seeing your characters out of your London studio in LA? Is, is it feel it's correct? A, I mean, it's kind of jarring, but I think it's it, it's kind of jarring and it kind of works as well because obviously they're you know it's an 18th century European costume, so. You know, it doesn't really visually. It doesn't necessarily fit in with what you'd imagine in California, but but I quite like that as well. Yeah. But and I think yeah, to go back to what you're saying about like this is the home of of home of movies, and I go to so I do photo shoots before I before I um before I paint, and I go to a lot of like a lot of prop warehouses and costume warehouses that facilitate the movie industry in, in London. So definitely kind of makes sense from from a, from a kind of a dress up point of view and a make believe point of view as well. Hip hop plays a big part yeah. in what you do. Well, how is there your relationship with hip hop changed over the years? I mean, I still listen to it a lot. I'm probably a bit more critical of it than I used to be, but maybe that's because I'm in my forties now, and a lot of us are like, "Wait a minute!" But I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm one of those forty-year-old rap fans that thinks everything was better in the nineties because right. I do think there's a lot of good stuff being made today. And I get really frustrated when people say. Oh, they can't rap anymore. I'm like, well, if you think they can't, they, if you think the twenty, the twenty year old rappers can't rap anymore, you're not listening to the right ones. Yeah, right. You know, because like, you just need to listen to uh, to Denzel Curry or somebody like that yeah, yeah. to realize that it's still alive and well. We were saying how yes, you know, you've been on the cover three times. Two thousand eight was the first time. Do you feel a kinship with that group of artists? Because I, I think when probably both of us being around the same age. Yeah. That Beyond the Streets opening in London, it felt like a kind of a reunion. Yeah. And there were so many people and so many different kind of... It felt like there was a... a gen, like there's just like this wonderful generation of painters and, and artists yeah. that all kind of came from the same era. Like, do you feel a kinship and kind of a... A kinship with your contemporaries in that way? Or is it kind of interesting to see how everybody's grown? Yeah, I mean, everybody looks a little bit older now. <laughs> Yeah, but no, that was a great moment at Beyond the Streets because there's a lot of people I hadn't seen in a long time. Um, and I think maybe London's been a bit quiet as well over mm -hmm. the last few years. Um, certainly the last five years, I think, from a, from a gallery point of view, it's been quiet. I feel like the emphasis has moved elsewhere. Mm -hmm. London had its moment. They had, they had like 10 years, let's say 2005 to 2015. Mm -hmm. But nothing, you know, nothing lasts forever. And I mean, again, that kind of goes back to my work. That's what, I'm, what I've always been quite interested in, is how kind of things change and how things start to fall apart as well. Um, I don't know if Brexit has had much of a role in that. I haven't figured that, that out yet, but I feel like it, the timeline is the same. That London's definitely been quiet um, from, a, from, a, from a graffiti and street art point of view. And a lot of the murals as well seem to be around Europe. I mean, there's a few in London, but it's, right. you know, it's not quite the... It's not quite as active as it should be, I think, considering how many artists there are right, in the country. Yeah. 
what gets you out of mural retirement? I know you're not retired, but no. you only do like one a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what, like, what, what, what is the, for, for everybody who's listening who wants Connor to do a mural? What is like your pitch that you like to hear? Oh man, I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a couple of interesting ones coming up. I think. Can you mention any? Uh, well, there's, there's a potential one in in Beirut. Oh, that I, re- I really want to go to Beirut. Yeah, yeah that's been yeah. kind of on my list for a long time. Yeah. But I kind of have to figure out what I'm going to do there, um, especially when you step outside of of Europe or when you step outside of the West and paint kind of figures that I paint. Mm-hmm. You definitely have to be careful with how it's going to be um, perceived. perceived. Yeah, yeah. Do you do special kind of research for something like that? I have to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is just kind of in the initial conversation okay that's a good one yeah and i might collaborate with a local artist there as well which i think would be really interesting i'd love to paint in japan yeah i think the japanese would really really get a kick out of out of like what you do i think they find it really really fascinating there isn't i don't think they've got much of a mural scene there just strange they have a little bit of a graffiti scene that's like i think i mean it's pretty um bold because i think the the penalty for graffiti there is quite significant although they like graffiti there a yeah. lot so it's a very i always found that weird because like hip-hop always seemed to be so big there you yeah. know especially back like uh, maybe in the 90s and the early 2000s like with, with D- djing and breakdancing i always yeah. felt would have been huge in japan but graffiti always felt like i don't know never quite took off in, to, to the same extent yeah but i think with me and murals it's not like i don't i can't see myself painting five a year I think I'm just too slow. You've mentioned slow a bunch of times. You, you don't you you don't work fast. Well, I mean, I don't I, I don't think I work any slower than a lot of other painters. Actually, I mean, I I felt like I was slow, but then when I you know got to know a few other muralists, I'm like, okay, they take a week to ten days as well. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, you don't have any assistance. I don't have any assistance. No, yeah. no. So my system is slow, and I'm also slow in the studio. So like my studio practice is quite demanding. So. I think painting murals really takes its toll on the studio. So right. the Beirut, the Beirut, trying to get you in Japan. This is definitely yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the push for a Japanese mural right now. Yeah. What else are you like looking forward to right now? I mean, you got a show on Friday. I understand that's like terrifying. Yeah, I'm looking forward to being over. You're, you're looking forward to the after party afterwards, where you can have like a, one of those kind of drinks where you're like, "This is the drink I can have right yeah. now without any repercussions after." Yeah. Um, but what's what's is there anything up next that you're kind of like? Or you just back into the studio, kind of. Just back into the studio. There's a few, a few projects coming up that I, I'm going to be working on, and possibly a sculpture as well that I'm really excited by. Like I think when I was in art college, actually, I was I kind of took to 3D easily enough. Like funnily enough, painting was the thing that I was probably the worst at. Yeah, I, I don't know. I but just if I, anyone can see my the look on my face, <laughs> I just gave Connor. I was so bad, man. I really was. I just I just didn't get it. I like was when I was. When I was younger, I just drew. I just drew like pencil. I just drew pencil and markers, and then kind of doing graffiti is painting, but it's not with a brush. So it's just you know it's just spray paint. So then when it came, like I just never used a brush. Like, I just didn't. I just right. didn't paint until I went to art college, and then I was like, oh, I think I might do painting. And then you realize you got to use a brush and oils. And it was so bad. I was so bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you were what? What did you were doing to me? Well, we just just kind of did a few a few projects in art college, and I just found I could kind of because I you know I think even with painting, I think even with painting, I find rendering three dimensional space comes to me easily enough. You know, light and shade. You know, mm-hmm. it's 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 something I've always found okay, mm-hmm. um, and that also translates into into working with clay. But I've just never, I just haven't really done anything about it in 20 years so there's a there might be a project brewing okay that's i mean that's i'm really glad you can kind of rekindle an old flame <laughs> you obviously started with spray paint and and it was like you know surfaces was something that was like really really kind of you know mm. something you had to think about now you work in the studio at a different pace you're in your 40s you're feeling like you have you still have international shows <laughs> you're going to work on sculptures is there something that you just you're dying to get done that is just on the bucket list. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I mean, I, yeah, I just want to, you know, I just, I just keep, I just want to keep going. I want to keep painting, and yeah, I'm quite, you know, I'm like, I know it's probably a weird thing to say, but I'm relatively pleased with the show. What do you mean? What do you mean? That's weird to say. Well, because I, I don't think I've ever said that about any show I've ever done. <laughs> oh, the one, the one in New York with the basketball court was really yeah. cool. You weren't relatively pleased with that? I don't know if I was as... The presentation was cool. The presentation was cool. And, you know, the paintings were okay, but there was things about them where I was like, ah, blah, you know, there's always going to be things that you're like, I'm not happy about X, Y, and Z. But I think this show feels a bit more 
kind of solid, I think. And I, I've been flowing, you know, I've been, yeah. I've been, I've, I've definitely been, been, been painting well, I think. Like I haven't come up against any speed bumps. We'll call this podcast the relatively speed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you, you feel like there's been, I, I, hate, I hate to say the word breakthrough, but like there's something that is happening right now that you're excited about. I think so. Like sometimes by the time you get to an exhibition, you're, you know, by the time you reach your deadline, you're just, oh, like, oh thank fuck, that's, that's done with because there was, you know, might have struggled here or there. Whereas with this, I, I just could have kept going. Like I had to stop because the paintings had to dry and they had to be <laughs> shipped across yeah. the world and stuff. But yeah, I was flowing. I was really kind of, I was, I was, <laughs> I was in my bag, as yeah. you guys would say. You're, you're in your bag. I mean, the world's shitty enough. So like you basically were able to capture how crappy the world is right now. Look, we're, we've been wanting to have you on the podcast for years. You've been three-time cover artist. It's so nice to get you on. It's so nice to have you on the occasion of a sunny day in Los Angeles. Mexican food in our belly. So, Connor, thank you so much for doing the Radio Juxtapose podcast.